All right, welcome to the July 2nd RBAC Proof of Concept Review. Um, this is designed mostly to be um, a discussion and information session. We're going to look at what has been done to date and um, also talk about some things that have not yet been solved in terms of, uh, of capabilities and requirements delivery. So let's start out before we get into the content uh, with asking any questions. All right, um, feel free to just jump in with questions. Uh, we want to um, make sure to try to get every, as many questions answered as we can. So uh, here's a link to the slides. I'll put this once more into the chat and this is going to be available into the, if you're watching this later, this will be in the YouTube uh, description down below. Um, also, uh, here's a link to the agenda uh, here as well. So what we're gonna go through today is we're gonna get an architectural overview uh, we're going to do a quick tour of the pulp file implementation. We're going to talk about a goal, uh, which is a highly customizable policy, and um, look at how a policy is implemented. And um, there's a question on here which is outdated, how to include in pulp core 3.5 or not. I'm actually going to address this one right now. Um, right now, uh, the plan is that we will not be making any RBAC um, additions for pulp core 3.5. Um, we're going to continue to develop the um, RBAC capabilities both in Pulp Core and in various plugins um, over the next month. And we are hoping that we will see the debut of some of these features for users starting in, in uh, the 3.6 releases, both Pulp Core and um, their compatibility releases. So that's roughly the, the overall timeline. Um, that would put Pulp Core's release, it's roughly a monthly cadence. So if, uh, pulp 3.5 is coming out on July 7th. So that would mean kind of early August as in terms of um, user facing features. Um, let's go over to the slides doc and you can see there's a link to pulp core code here and there's a link to pulp file code here. And if you click those links, you'll see the code. We're gonna be referring to the various parts of that throughout this. Um, let's see if I can operate this thing. Is this right? Yeah, here we go. So uh, this is an architecture diagram and um, the requests come in and all the requests that users interact with go to view sets and inside of the view sets, there's this um, access policy, uh, which is provided by this project called DRF access policy. And uh, what that, uh, we'll look at some, we'll look at some policies defined in the proof of concept, for example. And what they do is they check for various actions being allowed or denied. And they do that checking at either a model level or an object level. Um, model level being, I have a permission to create a remote, for example. And because I have it at the model level, I can create as many remotes as I want. Um, and versus an object level permission, which is a permission around a specific instance of that object. For instance, I can edit uh, or change a remote that already exists. There, the instance in that case is the, is the remote that already exists. And I can edit and change this specific one, remote foo, but I cannot change a different remote, remote bar. So that's um, what an object level permission means conceptually. So uh, please jump in with questions um, as you have them, if that's not clear. That was one of the requirements that we identified kind of early on. So that's where that's coming from. The, uh, these permissions checks ultimately are checking permissions um, that are stored in Pulp's database. And those permissions are related to users and groups. And the users and groups themselves are actually in Pulp's database. Um, we're gonna talk about how they get there here in a minute, but in all cases, Pulp's uh, users and groups are in the database. And then there's this little task code section here so task code uh, is dispatched and runs asynchronously and task code can also check permissions. It doesn't actually use DRF access policy because DRF access policy is very closely tied to view sets, but the task code um, uses the same underlying machinery to check model or object level permissions. So this is a look at the architecture. Any questions about this? Uh, permissions have three types. Um, talked about this a little bit already. Uh, model permissions. These are provided by Django built in. 
Um, so actually, if you look in Pulp's database today, there are already um, uh, four permissions for each model type. We'll talk about that a little bit in, in a minute. But um, the model permissions are already built in. Uh, what isn't built into Django are object level permissions. And a project called Django Guardian is the largest, most well-known, heavily used um, object level uh, project. And its whole purpose is to give you object level permissions. So again, this is what lets you um, assign permissions to a specific instance of an object, but not others, uh, for example. So that's the object level thing. Then uh, it allows, Django Guardian specifically allows us to work with Django's built-in permissions. And so it provides a consistent um, developer experience around checking permissions. So that's pretty great. Uh, then there are also custom permissions. Django, also, Django Guardian also provides these. They're called custom just because um, you can name them whatever you want and you can have any number of them. And we'll look at an example of those as well. So there are three permissions types. Uh, we're going to talk about each of them just in a little bit of detail. Model permissions, uh, there are four permission types for each model. And these are the ones that are already in Pulp's database. So there's an add, a view, a change, and a delete. Um, they're very high level. They don't talk about specific instances of these uh, objects. They only talk about the, the models themselves. They're automatically created by Django. Um, they are scoped by the Django app. So um, the models for Pulp Core, for example, um, each model will get four of these. And that whole set of all the models and all the permissions are scoped under um, in the database under the core app. And then all the plugins similarly have their own. So they're not, they're, they're organized is, is the point. And uh, they're already available. So if you go into PowerShell or Shell or in the ORM, you can look up the permission object and look up all the permissions that are already loaded in every database that's ever been installed. Uh, here's an actual example. So for file remote, um, you this is the scoping part, the file dot. This is the file app. And then the add view change here. And then this is the, object, the model type, file remote, file remote. Uh, Object level permissions, Django Guardian facilitates these. And we're just going to take a quick look at the assignment checking and removal of object level permissions. Uh, so assignment is pretty easy. You can assign them permissions to either a user or a group. And you can do them with this assign perm here. And it's pretty easy. This is the permission name. And this is the thing you're assigning it to. Uh, and this is the object that is receiving it. So you can look at these links um, later. Similarly for groups, it actually works the exact same way. Uh, so that's assignment. And we're going to look at code that uses this stuff here. So these are kind of just generic examples. Um, checking, uh, you can check with this has perm option. Um, and when I said that the Django Guardian permissions are integrated with Django, um, what I mean is that this has perm is actually from Django. And so it's pretty great because you can just use this one has perm call to check either model level where you just don't pass a, a second, this optional, the second parameter is optional. Um, or you can, uh, well, no, actually, sorry. This is, the, this is the required one. This is the model being checked. But you can also um, pass extra an extra option, and that will be the object itself. And we'll look at some examples of that. So my point with this part of it, really just if I've confused you, um, or maybe I confused myself, is uh, that it's unified in terms of how Django is already performing checking. So you don't have to do stuff with Django and then do stuff with Django Guardian. You can just use the, the Django calls and Django Guardians involved underneath, which is really nice. And similarly, removing is pretty straightforward. There's a remove permission, and this takes either a user or a group. Pretty easy. Um, custom permissions. So uh, any model can define custom permissions. Um, here's a look at the POC. And uh, it defines one custom permission. So this is on file repository. Uh, for remotes, so the POC governs 
and restricts operations around remotes and um, file repositories. Remotes only have really CRUD operations. So the standard four built-in permissions are all you need. But for file remotes, uh, we also want to restrict sync and modify operations and uh, around whether you can or cannot create or modify repository versions. And so there isn't a, those four built-in permissions don't really capture that. So what we need to do is we need to define a custom permission. And what we've done here is uh, define one called modify repo content. And it's on a file repository. And uh, this is an example of a custom permission. And what happens is uh, Django guard, you just define this in the permission set on your, in your meta class. And Django Guardian will generate you one of these when you go to make migrations. And this is what's actually adding it into the permissions database here. So easy to define, easy to roll out. Uh, that's a custom permission. Any questions so far? Just jump right in. And this modify permission would be used for syncing also? Yes, um, and we're exactly. So this modified permission is checked when the sync call is run, the sync action, and it's also checked um, for uh, the modify endpoint. The modify endpoint. Yes, exactly. Okay. And this is just an example, Brian. If you wanted to say have a role that says you're allowed to sync things, but you're not allowed to push content directly, then we would just break this into two different permissions. Correct? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep, there's nothing, um, the name is just a name, and right. really its power comes from how the policy uses it. Exactly. So you can have more of them, and you can also mix and match in terms of what the policy has. Brian, what about upload? Um, I didn't do anything with upload, but upload I think would work similarly. Um, yeah. re remind me, what endpoint does upload go onto? Does it go straight onto a repository? No, I think it's, it's on content. I, a content and then repository optionally can be provided as a argument. Yeah, so we'll have to provide an, an access policy for that as well. So that, is, um, would someone be able to capture that on the still needs to be done list um, if, uh, on our notes? Yeah. That would be really helpful for me. Um, so that's not included today. That would need to be included because um, that's another place where you can modify a repository. So that's that's important. Yep. Yeah, and I think uh, breaking it up, the permissions uh, between modify and sync as being separate permissions is also good. OK. Um, Just to capture it in the action items, that's all. Sure, that's fine. Yep. Um, what I else? I have another question. Yeah, great. Um, uh, when you think about you have namespaces and you want to allow some users to create remotes in some namespaces, but not in others? Would that be a model or a object permission? Um, I don't know. Uh, there, so one of the ideas that I've been thinking about and kind of struggling with, I think is in line with what you're asking about. And it has to do with um, configurable permissions. So the problem with what we have, the limitation with what we have now is that, um, well, actually, no, sorry, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop that line of thinking right there because actually this is straightforward. Um, the, they would be object level permissions and they would be assigned to specific namespaces. Um, so and if you have, Mm -hmm. Do we mean that namespace is an object? Yes, I namespace, think so, yeah. yes, yep. Uh, and and for pulp Ansible has a similar thing. I assume you're asking in the context of pulp container. Yes. Yeah. And is that the case on pulp container? There's actually a object. We have we have not created this yet, but we plan to. Okay. So yeah, the, I think the recommendation there um, is to have that be an object and then to have um, object level permissions um, applied to it and to check. If you have the model level one, you can manage all the namespaces. If you have the object level ones, then you can manage these, but not those. 
Okay. That makes sense. Um, Thank you. Sure. Yep. Um, I love the questions. Um, so just jump right in. Uh, okay, users and groups. Users and groups are always stored in Django's database, and they need to be so because uh, we need to have permissions relate to them in terms of foreign keys. Um, and uh, but we we have a very strong requirement for external users and groups also. So we'll talk about how we rectify these here in a moment. But in all cases, um, they end up in Django's database. Um, Django admin can be used to view and modify users, and uh, their oh, their users, their groups, um, group membership, and the permissions associated with each group. Um, to access Django admin, is staff needs to be true, and um, there is. Uh, if, I, if I go back and I look at the, actually the pulp core code here. Um, if we look at the pulp core code, uh, now the create reset admin password sets is staff on admin. So this is what you're going to need. And if you want to log into the Django admin interface, which we'll do here in a moment, I've also added a data migration in case users have already created an admin user. And if they haven't, it will just pass. But if they have, it will set is staff for them as well. And what you'll get, uh, this PR also enables um, the admin site here. It's available at slash admin. And uh, these two here in the middle lines, just since we're here, these are what enable Django Guardian. So if we go here, uh, we can look in, uh, at this is the slash admin login on my little test. And it's got the default creds. And this is a look at the um, users and groups site. So when we launch this, uh, Django admin, if we end up using this Django admin right, right now, it's position that we will, but it's up for discussion. Um, and uh, the only thing that will be in here are users and groups, because Django admin by default has nothing in it except users and groups. And if you want more available, then you, you enable those. So uh, in terms of launching this feature to be able to have administrators modify and control users and groups, this is a pretty safe launch. Um, it's great because if all you want to do is create a couple of users and create a couple of groups, you can just do that in here. And uh, what I've done is I've already populated this with some users and groups. Um, there's Alice and Bob and Eve. And those are our three users we'll be um, looking at here in a little bit. Um, notice admin has the staff status. So it's actually the only thing that can log into this Django admin interface. I'm logged in as user admin. Um, you can look at Alice. For example, um, there's a group here called the File Global Admin, and this is specifically part of the proof of concept. This is a name that I've chosen. This is changeable and debatable. Um, but the idea is I wanted to demonstrate the policy being able to give very, very broad access just by group membership alone. And so Alice in this POC is going to have very, very broad access because um, she's a member of the File Global Admin group. Um, and you can see her group membership is available here. Um, she does not have any individual permissions. This is a list, look, look at all the permissions for all the models. Um, and oops, sorry. Uh, so she doesn't actually have any direct permissions. So she has no, these are user level permissions because they'd be permissions assigned directly to a user. Um, and uh, right now, Bob and Eve have no permissions and no groups. So they're not in the group and they have no user permissions, and we'll be messing with this here in a little bit. So that's Django admin. Um, that's the workhorse of admins uh, using their users and groups. Um, but we need to allow external users and groups. And so um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, but there's actually a lot of links. Um, particularly, I spent a lot of time looking at Django auth LDAP to put together a proof of concept on how you can inter integrate Pulp directly with LDAP. Um, and this link here, I'll just kind of show it to you, um, has lots of notes on exactly what I did, along with links to um, the code, which uh, 
are specifically, it's just, it's literally 100% settings. There's no actual changes needed in pulp. So a user even today could enable this with zero changes in pulp core, just using Dynaconf. Um, and this effectively hooks it up to LDAP and this is how you can configure LDAP. Um, so that's, uh, and that's actually in this demo system, this is how the users and groups are brought in. But um, the, the real point is that um, Pulp is going to be agnostic to how users and groups are brought in when they're external. Um, so LDAP's an option. You can also do all your user and group stuff in your web server. Um, so there's a, a really great um, testing repo here that shows a lot of different testing that can happen. Um, also, uh, this shows kind of different types of identity servers that you can integrate with Kerberos and FreeIPA and SAML and OpenID, all those sorts of things. That's great. Um, and in those cases, what tends to happen is the user and group data comes in via um, variables, additional variables. And there are these middlewares that run uh, in Django so that as the user is logging in, um, Django is eating up those headers and it's populating its user and group data. And there are even more. And that's the great thing about this architecture is that anything that you can do to get users and groups into Django, and there are many, many options out there, will work just fine with this. Um, so that's a look at the story around users and groups, external users and groups. Any questions on that? Um, cool. So uh, we kind of already went over this one. Actually, we already went over this. So we enable Django Guardian. We enable Django Admin. We set is staff. That's all that's needed in Pulp Core today. So let's talk about DRF access policy. So DRF access policy is modeled after Amazon's IAM um, policy engine. So it's the identity access management, I believe, um, portion of Amazon. So whatever you know, web services like S3 or EC2 or whatever, um, you can go in there and finally control the policies of which users can do what things. And this is very, very powerful. Um, so DRF access policy is also very simple. Um, it has uh, these four things. So it's got who can do it, that's the principle. It's got what they're doing, the action. It has an allow or deny, that's the outcome of the decision. And it has this condition, and these are extra requirements. And the uh, if, if these are all met, then it will be allowed. And if any of them are not met, then you, they will be denied. Most of our logic is in these conditions. Uh, you can get a look at these statement elements here. This is the docs to them. And um, uh, we're gonna actually look at some real examples, so I won't take you through there, but that's a look at the reference for it. Uh, POC requirements, um, there's a whole document here on the requirements for the proof of concept. It outlines um, a whole bunch of things that we're not gonna go through. Um, what we are, we're gonna look at, these are somewhat abstract requirements. And so my approach here is to show you something concrete and then you can go back and look at this document and see how we're fulfilling them because these, uh, these requirements are a little bit abstract. Um, all the requirements are met except for uh, permissions checking and task. We haven't demonstrated that. And that's that's something that we're gonna talk about here at the end. Uh, all right, let's move on to some of the, the actual interesting stuff. So there's two policies included in this POC. Um, one is a file remote, and these line numbers are not correct anymore. Uh, yeah, they're not right anymore. So um, how, does this, how does this work? Uh, there's a file remote access policy and then there's a file repository access policy. Both of these inherit from base access policy, and this is the DRF access policy base object. And so when you're writing an access policy, you inherit from this. Um, we didn't create this, this came from their project. Um, these are the statements that actually drive the policy. And uh, for remotes, for example, this is 100% of what's required for governing um, the create, read, update, and delete operations. And so let's actually look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, so the way DRF access policy works is 
Uh, well, actually, let me do, do this real quick. So file remote access policy, yes, it's a policy, but it also has to be enforced. And it's enforced by adding it as a permission classes list into this here. And this is a DRF thing. So DRF access policy is to integrate with DRF. And uh, so on the view set itself, how does it know what to use? It uses it from this. So that's, that's that. All right, let's look at this policy. So I'm just gonna talk through this. Please ask questions, because this is the really the, the main logic. Um, so uh, DRF access policy, when you're protecting a view set, will default to deny. So unless one of these statements matches with allow, then it will be denied. If any of the statements match allow, it is allowed. Um, not all statements apply to all actions. And so even though they're all here, they're not all in play on any given request. Two, if you have multiple statements that are in play, then deny it. Um, like if one says effective specifically allow and the other one says a deny, we don't have any deny rules here. Um, we just let the default denial handle the, all those cases. But um, if you have conflicting um, uh, outcomes, then deny is what prevails. So with that in mind. Yep. For the list permission there. Yes. Oh, for the list action. Yes. Um, what does principal star mean? Yes, principal star. So DRF access policy has these um, kind of helper built-in things. And there aren't very many of them, but star is one of them. And that means all, any. And, and principal, is that an, a user? Uh, principal is uh, the who. And so this could be a user or group. OK. Um, great question. So this, so this says anybody can list their remotes. That's right. Uh, listing, anyone can list the remotes. That's exactly Even what it says. Even an anonymous user? Even an anonymous user. Um, okay. In fact, DRF access policy has, in the statements elements section, it shows the special values here. So this is in that um, principal action area. And uh, star is any user. Um, oh, okay. Do you have authentic, yep, you, or you have these as well. Awesome. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, you can also list users specifically. Uh, you can also list admin uh, groups specifically, and you can also list a mixture of them with a list form here as well. And can you do this dynamically? Uh, you can do it dynamically, and um, we will look at a little bit of that here in a little bit. Um, you okay. probably want to have some of your dynamic things done as conditions, because conditions are the the kind of really meaty part of the logic. Um, and this is really the big dynamic part. So what you might do is have your principle be very broad, but have conditions that check for a lot of dynamic conditions. Okay. That's um, yeah. Um, uh, love the questions. Please jump in with them. Um, so I said earlier that I wanted this group to um, have very, very broad access. Basically, they're like the site admin for this plugin type, kind of. Um, and uh, so they should be able to sidestep the RBAC policy basically entirely. So what that looks like is for any action, if you're in, uh, if this person is a member of this group, then allow them. And Alice in our POC, as we'll see when we run some commands here, is that person. Um, so then these remaining statements kind of govern everyone else. Um, if you're going to create uh, anyone creating, but again, if, if, if you already match this rule and you're allowed, then you're just allowed. Um, and so uh, Alice is basically pretty much allowed entirely just from this one. Um, but if you're not in that group, because you didn't get allowed through that statement, then you'll be creating a remote. And if you're anyone, then you'll be allowed if you meet this condition. And this is the first time that we're seeing these um, helper functions that, that I've made in the POC. These are not provided anywhere else. And it's called, called has model perms. 
And there's also a helper I made called has model or object perms. Um, those are contained inside here as well. They are, um, they're over here in, in this thing called global access conditions. Um, DRF access policy has this feature called global access conditions where you can configure um, a, you can configure these reusable conditions that are available to all access policies. And this avoids you having to make base classes, which you have to like propagate throughout a whole bunch of places. Um, over time, I expect that this is actually gonna move into pulp core, but um, it just takes a little bit more time and effort and then you get straddled between different PRs. So just for simplicity, I've included it here, but the idea is that these global access permissions are gonna be very broadly usable and it's like a toolbox that, let, that you can build up over time. Um, you can check the model being requested itself. And we'll also see that there are there need to be checks that can check for things like a parameter. So not the model itself, um, but for instance, when you're modifying a file repository with the sync action, you wanna check permissions around whether that user has the right to read the remote that's being used to sync with. And so we need to have these in the toolbox, we need to have some helper methods that can also check those that remote specifically. Um, so we'll see these in action. Uh, and that's where they come from. And so this is a dynamic check in the sense that um, this is the fun, this is the, I guess it's a function, this is the function name being called and this is the permission argument that flows into it. So has model perms, and this is file, add file remote. Okay, let's go down to here. Here we are, has model perms. This is because that string is there that this method will be called. And permission is what shows up as the string. What was that second one? Add file, file dot add underscore file remote. So, and this is that Django, uh, Django check has perm, and we're just checking for this user having this permission. So um, this is all that's needed. So it's, it's actually through these things that we're kind of wiring up DRF access policy with Django Guardian. Um, you could have other things in here, but this is the way that it's positioned. So back to the policy. Um, this will allow anyone with the add file remote uh, check to, uh, sorry, permission to 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 be created. Um, and so before we go too much further, let's actually just look at that in action. I can just find out where it is. It's not that. Um, Brian? Mm -hmm. And um, is it how, how you will um, have this namespace check for remote creation? Will it be also from here or? Um, yeah, we can, uh, sure, I can answer that. Um, if I can just figure out where I'm going. Um, so if we look down, you'll see this is all very similar. Um, and if we look at the actual sync and the modify actions, um, they have multiple conditions that are checked. And this says, uh, for example, sync, let's interpret the sync policy. Um, well, the user has to have this custom modify repo content permission at either the model or the object level. And because both of these conditions have to be met, they have to have this file view file remote permission. And we're using the has remote param model or object perms. So this is the helper function that knows to be checking the remote parameter. And then uh, the case of uh, namespace, it would be checking the namespace instead of a remote. That's right. Thank you for bringing me back to the question. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And this is where we need more tools in the toolbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, love the questions. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at, I can just figure out where I'm going here. Um, there's a link to this a little bit later. Um, I'll also put this into the chat, uh, just here for fun. 
Um, so these are a bunch of commands that you can run against this POC. Um, here, uh, the username is equal to the password. And when you produce the basic authentication, um, basic auth uh, header, you end up with these three headers. And so Alice can do lots and lots. So um, let's have Alice list remotes. Um, Uh, what am I doing wrong here? This is going to be a terrible demo if this doesn't work. Oh, you have a quote after remote. Oh, no. Alice has written no. Oh. You know what? I was actually doing this slightly differently before. I was doing it from here. And I think that's a different character. Yep. <laughs> I was like, I've done this a hundred times. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Pro tip. Don't use this one. Use this one. Um, so Alice list remotes. So really, I'm just proving to you that there are no remotes here in the system. Uh, Alice um, can create a remote because Alice is in the epic group. And that top allow statement allows Alice to have her remote created. And then if we list that remote from Alice, we can see it here. Um, but then uh, if we go down here, a bunch of commands for Alice, then we come to Bob's commands. And these are all the same commands, only they have slightly different names and they have uh, Bob's authorization cred here instead. So Bob does not yet have user permissions to be able to enable to create a remote. And so it says, you do not have permissions to perform this action. And the reason is because uh, the create, they're, they're not matching on this one, and this is the only other rule that could possibly grant them an allow. And they do not have the has model, they don't have the model permissions to create any file remote at all. And so why don't we go over here to Bob in the Django admin? And let's, uh, let's add, um, we're gonna go ahead and add two permissions here because Bob can add file repositories and file remotes. We'll save. And then we'll go back and run that same command. And now Bob is able to do things. Um, so Bob's remote got created, um, Bob rejoices, and that is uh, how this works um, for create. And it's uh, the, the retrieve, destroy, update, and partial update are the other read, update, delete operations. Um, these need to check at both the model level and the object level. So it uses a slightly different helper, um, has model or object permissions. And that's because create is really the one that's different. And it's because there isn't an object yet created here. So you can't check an object level permission when there ain't no object. So this is a look at the policy. Any questions about this? I'm assuming this, this list of statements is applied in order. Um, or they're not actually I in an, they're not actually in an order. Um, they're all applied. And they're, you should think of them as filtering. Um, so the request when it arrives at DRF access policy is filtered to determine which statements apply. And then those are checked. And anyone that grants an allow allows them through. Unless one of the ones that matches and passes specifically grants a deny. But in this case, all of our stuff is allow statements. So if any one of them matches, it's allowed. So Brian, if I were if I were a dumb admin and I gave somebody a, a specific person, say create access, but then had a, a wildcard permission for that person that was deny, then the deny would win. That's right. And when I tried to do a create, because deny always wins. So if you have multiple rules that match a given thing you're trying to do, if any of them says deny, you're denied. That's right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep, and deny is an explicit outcome versus not allowed. <laughs> Those are actually not the same thing, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Um, but there are some negative rules that the effect is literally written as deny. And so if you have two rules and they both produce allows, one of them lets you in, then you're good. Um, even if the other one isn't allow and it doesn't let you in. But if you have two rules and one of them is a deny and you 
and it returns true for both allow and deny, then you are not let in. Um, so that is a look at the policy. Um, and similarly, we kind of already went through this down here, but sync checks multiple things. So sync, when you go to sync, this is on a file repository itself, you're checking the model or object level permissions that the user can modify these things. But you also need to make sure that they have the right to view the remote at all. Um, and this could be granted at either the model or object level as well. So, um, and modify is the same. I think this is, is this right or wrong? Oh yeah, this is right because there isn't a remote involved when you modify. So it's just one check. Can I modify this repo's content? Um, so we kind of already went through this. Actually, this roughly is what we just went through. So you have three users. Alice is the global admin. Bob gets these two permissions. We added these. Eve gets nothing. Eve is evil. And these are the commands we've been looking at. Um, so uh, I need my little presentation doesn't cover how permissions are granted. But the way that this works is that um, there's this create and destroy. So Permission, object level permissions, like how do those get created? Right now in the POC, they get created using this mixin, which at the view set level kind of just does some things and then calls super. So typically these are inherited on the view sets, these create and destroy methods. So this um, kind of gives an opportunity for us to do a little more. And what it does is it, um, you at the view set level, uh, it, it reads out of this list of what are the auto assigned object permissions. And at creation time, you're going to assign those to that specific object with the same assign perm shortcut we looked at earlier. And it will be assigning that permission to that user um, and for the object that was created. And it's this third parameter, that's this is the optional one I was talking about in Django, that when you have Django Guardian installed, it becomes meaningful, and we're using it meaningfully here. Um, then destroy, we want to clean up. These do not get destroyed automatically. There's no cascade delete here. So we're going to remove, when we delete an object, we're going to remove it from the user's permissions who are deleting it. You will notice that, you may notice that this is not a, really a full cleanup, perhaps. And this is one of the open-ended problems we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but this is how these permissions are assigned. And if we look uh, at the file repository view set, they get four permissions, because they get view, change, and delete. Um, having create assigned to at the object level doesn't make sense, because it's already there. Um, so view, change, and delete. And then we also automatically give them modify. Um, similarly, for the remote view set, there's only three. There's only view, change, and delete. And you can see, go ahead. I was just going to give you a quick time check. You have uh, nine minutes. Yep. And um, so that's how objects are assigned and removed. And um, the other thing to know uh, is that there's query set scoping in here. This is a big feature. So this scope query set is actually, I died, I, I, or this is not right. This is something that's provided by our code. And access policy is the one from DRF access policy. And this is a this is a parent, um, an ancestor of, um, of both of the policies. And it adds this single method squ scope query set. And what this one does is it looks to see if the user's in file global admins. This is another integration point. And um, if they are in the file global admin, then they get to see everything. So we're not providing any query sets filtering here. If not, then what we're going to do is we're going to use this really great helper method from Django Guardian, which says, get me the object for this user. And it will actually return to you just the subset of objects that um, that user has access to. And so this is pretty slick, because if we go to here and we ask Bob to list the remotes, Bob only sees one remote. But Alice has access to everything, because she's a file global admin. And Alice sees two remotes. And Eve is evil. 
So it uses nothing. Um, so this is the query set filter in future. Um, and the same applies for remotes. And so um, that's literally the whole POC. Um, so there's a couple things missing. Uh, there's three parts to this. One is the need to assign object level permissions inside of tasks. So right now, the mixin only ha uh, will assign those object level permissions inside of the view sets. And so we need to demonstrate permission checks inside of tasks, but we also need to demonstrate um, objects that are created in tasks to have their object level permissions. So the problem with this is that it duplicates the object level permissions code between the tasks and the view sets. Um, and thanks to Matthias for his um, pointing out that this uh, that this is not such a super easy thing to accomplish because um, we need to preserve the requests, users, and group context all the way back into the tasking system. Um, this is actually a pretty straightforward thing to do, but it's it's a piece of work, and this is what I plan to go on to do after this. Um, also, the at that point it'll be pretty great because the instead of having this mix in here where uh, instead of having this mix in where you have to have these shim methods here, um, actually the signals on the model save itself will just handle it. And it'll handle it whether it's in a task or whether it's in a view set. So that's great. Um, this one seems pretty straightforward. If you have an idea or kind of proposal or concern, let me know. Um, the Permissions are assigned at either the group or user level. So one of the deficiencies of this POC is you may notice is that if you get access to something due to your group and you're a single user, right now the POC is going to assign your object level permissions to your user. And that's not right because you're part of a group and everyone in that group should have access to it. So what we need to do, they're, they're all, the problem is you're only assigned at the user level. So what we need to do is we need to add some centralized machinery that will inspect how the user actually received those permissions and then make sure that we're assigning the object level permissions at that same level. Um, so that's the idea. Um, this, is, this is the first one's very straightforward. This one's medium straightforward. Um, part three, uh, we need an API, this is just straight up missing. We need an API to view all the effective permissions, um, particularly in cases where, for example, Galaxy NG has a user interface. Um, yes, they'll receive a scope query set, so they're already getting some benefit in terms of only being able to see things that they could manage. But um, if you wanna be able to know, can a user do a particular thing, you need an API that can tell you what are my effective permissions. So this needs some more design this is actually going to go out for some design discussions. So this will this will probably be happening on the mailing list. But um, uh, this is a thing that's missing. And that's that's the end of my content. So um, what questions do folks have? We have four minutes left um, about this. So Brian, I have a, a kind of a longish term question before we go GA with this. Have we thought about having a set of um, standard groups defined in pulp three for the kinds of roles that make sense for the average pulp three installation. Because one of the problems I've seen us have in the past, not pulp three, but just Red Hat in general, is here's a, a really, really capable uh, RBAC implementation and every admin gets to define, has to define their own roles about and then assign specific object and model level permissions to them and then assign those rules to people. Are we have we given any thought to coming out with a here's a here's a standard set that you can use or not? Um, yeah, this is a killer question. In fact, it points out a piece of content that I just forgot to put in here. Um, okay. We need to give a little bit more thought to what we mean by the word role. Right now, I'm using a role as a group. Um, you'll notice the policy interacts with groups and the query set scoping interacts with groups. So um, one of the concerns, uh, this, this is an open thing, one of the concerns is that um, if you already have a bunch of groups, um, how do you have your policies use those? And similarly, the question that you're asking, um, do we ship groups automatically? I think that we do wanna ship groups automatically and I think the default policy should be using those. Um, I 
want to point out, uh, I want to share my screen once more here. Um, so uh, I, I neglected, besides that negligence, I neglected one other thing, which is that um, uh, the goal, the overall goal of this it, from the highest level is to put the policy into the hands of the user. And so you'll notice this is all in code. And so um, what DRF access policy recommends is that um, there's this thing called loading external statements. And the idea here is that you can, instead of having the statements in code, you can actually load them from a database. And so what we want to do is turn over control to make the policy fully users. And actually, if you look back at our agenda, this is the highest level. This is actually the highest level thing. This is the highest level goal to have a highly customizable policy and to ship also to ship a default one. So um, these statements, golly, there's a lot of tabs going on here. Um, these statements will likely be moved into a database and the default groups that they interact with will likely be created via migrations. And in the case where you have a large amount of users and groups, a large amount of groups already, what you'll want to do is you'll want to modify that policy to replace this group name with your existing group names. Um, so uh, we have one minute left. Um, is there any final questions? What's the tooling for debugging and troubleshooting this look like and related to what you just said? Is there any kind of auditing of uh, permissions, permission, any of that built in anyway? Um, there isn't any of it built in. Um, if I haven't seen what DRF access policy does when you turn on debug mode, so I would I would do I will do that, and I hope that it will provide me something. If it, but regardless, we absolutely need to make debugging this really straightforward because it's very confusing on a pulp installation when you can't see all the objects. Um, and so I think at a minimum, we'll since we're providing these check statements here, we'll be putting in log debug statements here. Um, in fact, I need to make that as part of the POC because I've already confused myself on at least twice. Um, that's our time. So where where do we go from here? Uh, I'm going to work on these next couple of things, um, the things that we talked about. I'll send those out to the list. Um, I think we want to try to broaden the pulp file policy to include publications, which it doesn't do. We also need to have it govern uploads. Um, we want to. I would like to ask each mini team to think about their, um, how do I stop this? Uh, stop present. I'd like to ask each mini team to think about the um, policies that you want and to write out the use cases that you want and send them to the list for discussion if that's helpful. And um, we can write a policy together and try having um, it use this shared toolbox of permissions checks. Um, I'm over my time already, so I just want to thank everybody who collaborated on this, and um, thanks for your time attending. Thanks, Brian. It's great.